feel like I've gotten really bogged down into in Genesis chapter 6 here. And uh, I'd like to finish it tonight, but I might get bogged down again. <laughs> but anyhow, Genesis chapter 6. So um, I have marked in my notes that I'm only at like verses 5 and 6. Because um, we spent a lot of time talking about the Nephilim. We spent a lot of time talking about the sons of God and the daughters of men. And we kind of had to had to wrestle with that a little bit. So uh, I guess that's why it's taking me so long uh, here. So we're going to start in, in about verse 5. It says, So then the Lord uh, saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he made man on earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So, uh, you know, it's interesting to say, and again, to say, and again, if you remember from Matthew 24, uh, Jesus said that just like it was in the days of Noah, that's how it's going to be uh, in the end. That's what the end times are going to be like. And so I was saying that we need to take notice of, of what it was like during the days of Noah so we could, um, you know, we could look at ourselves and see if that's where we where we are he says that uh verse five that every intent of the thoughts of his heart of man's heart uh was only evil continually all the time there was just a a, a complete and a constant um evil and wickedness that that comes out of man's heart and uh um you know of course we're the salt of the earth uh as jesus says but uh we certainly don't like to point fingers at ourselves, right? But I mean, look, we're we're he we're headed headlong right into that place where it just seems like uh, all the all the thoughts of everyone is just just uh, evil. Verse six is a little says that the Lord was sorry that He made man on the earth and that He was grieved in His heart. Uh, and so then, what you're going to have here, right? Obviously, is you're going to have uh, God bringing this judgment. So this kind of an issue of, of, you know, does God change his mind? Does God change his mind? Can God change his mind? Uh, what does it mean if God does change his mind? And you can, you'd be surprised at, uh, some people have real strong opinions on both sides of this thing. Um, it, and it doesn't, it doesn't really say here that God changed his mind, but it certainly says that he was sorry that he made man. Said so that he was sorry that he had even made man, and then he's going to bring this judgment. Uh, so, it, so it is going to start over. There is a passage in First Samuel fifteen, uh, verse eleven, where he's talking about King Saul, and I believe it uses the word "repented." It, it says that God repented uh, that he had uh, made Saul, or that he had. Let me get that verse for you exactly. First Samuel 15. First Samuel 15, 11, he says, I greatly regret that I have set up Saul as king. He has turned back from following me and he's not performed my commandments and it grieved Samuel and he cried out to the Lord all night. Um, so the Lord said to Samuel, I regret that I have set Saul up uh, as a king. So, you know, does God make a mistake? Did he make a mistake putting Saul as a king? Did he make a mistake with the people that he had created uh, back there in Genesis chapter 6? Is he changing his mind? He's sorry about doing it. He's, he's, he's changing something because then you take a couple of other verses. Hebrews 13, 8, uh, I believe it says that Jesus is the same yesterday and today and forever. Um, James chapter 1, uh, verse, verse 15, 17. James chapter 1, verse 17 says this. says, every good and perfect gift is from God, is from above, and it comes down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. Uh, so James says, you know, he doesn't vary, he doesn't turn. Uh, so can God change his mind? Let me just throw that out there, y'all. Can God change his mind? Okay. I mean, mm -hmm. that's kind of one of those, I mean, did, one of those mysteries. Right? So did God make a mistake when he made Saul king? Did God make a mistake with these people that he's now sorry that he made? 
Um, someone else. Can God change his mind? Do what now? Okay. Daryl? That's what I was going to say. It's not God so much to change. It's exactly what I was going to say. <laughs> Someone else? I think it was Saul that made the mistake. And God uh, was grieved over it. Right. You know? Right. Because he had free will to do that. Right. Like Saul did. Right. So I think you guys kind of view it uh, the same way I do. It's not so much that God changed. It's so much that the people changed and their attitudes and acceptance of his, him changed. So it makes it look like he changed, but he really didn't change. It wasn't God that changed. It was us that changed. It was the people that changed. It was Saul that changed, uh, that didn't seek after him anymore. And so it appears uh, that, that he did. And so in this particular case, in Genesis chapter 6 that we're looking at, so God is going to bring his judgment up on the world. But the world has become so wicked and so evil that his holiness demands this justice. And so he has to bring uh, this justice uh, upon the world. And in verse 6, you know, it says he was sorry that he made man on the earth. But then right after that, it also says that he was grieved in his heart. It wasn't like God took pleasure in this. It wasn't like uh, he was just happy to do this. You know, that it, he was grieved in his heart. It was a burden in his heart uh, that he didn't uh, like what he knew uh, that he was about to do. So verse 7, so the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and creeping thing and the birds of the air. I am sorry that I have made them. Uh, verse 8, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Well, it's kind of a break there, so I better stop. So, um, so again, the wickedness was worldwide, so the judgment had to be worldwide. So he's going to send this uh, judging flood <clears throat> upon the earth and, and upon the world. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Now, we're actually going to see here in just a second. In fact, I guess I should just go ahead and read it. Um, in verse 9 it says, now this is the genealogy of Noah. So you can see it kind of, it acts like it starts over. It gives, it starts with another genealogy. Uh, the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So I want to give you some steps. In verse 8 it says, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And then it says in verse 9 that he was a just man. And then it says that he was perfect in his generations, and he walked with God. Let, let me tell you something. Uh, he was a just man. He was perfect in his generations. He walked with God. All that in verse 9. You know what? That doesn't exclude verse 8. Noah still needed grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah still needed grace. And it was by grace that God saved Noah. And we can talk about how good Noah was. And he apparently was. But, but ultimately it was grace. None of us deserves what God has for us. None of us deserves what God gives to us. None of us deserves uh, anything really from God. And it all starts with grace. And uh, grace is what all of us need. So then though... Just to kind of New Testament eyes it a little bit. So, uh, and I think it just kind of gives a perfect, a perfect order there. That he found grace in God's eyes. And then it says he was a just man. We find grace in God's eyes. And then we are justified. Uh, and we are justified uh, by the grace of God. By the salvation of God. And then it says he was perfect. Uh, he was complete. And so we are, we find grace uh, in God. We're justified. We become complete uh, through the spirit. And through sanctification, and then we can walk with God. And just like it says there was the last thing with Noah, it was that, that Noah walked with God. And we talked about that a little bit um, in, uh, when we talked about Enoch and how, how Enoch walked with God. Uh, let me read a couple of verses. I, I Actually, I have them here. I don't remember, to be honest with you, exactly what they say. Second Peter 2, 5. 2 Peter 2, 5 says, God did not, I'm going to start in 2, 4. God did not spare the angels who sinned, but cast them down to hell and delivered them into the chains of darkness to be reserved for judgment. And he did not spare the ancient world, but he saved Noah, one of eight people, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood on the world of the ungodly. So he says there that Noah was a, a, a preacher of righteousness. And I'm going to talk about that here in just a second. So just kind of hang on to the memory of that one. Uh, Hebrews 11, 
uh, 7 again says that it was by faith that Noah being divinely warned. I have these two verses in a place that's completely not where they, they belong. But I'll go ahead and read them. Um, but, but by faith Noah being divinely warned of things not yet seen. Moved with godly peer, fear. Prepared an ark for the saving of his household. Uh, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness, which is according to faith. But Noah found grace in God's eyes. He was a just man. He was perfect, and he walked with God. Um, so again, we've talked about the reasons, 11 through 13. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed, it was corrupt in all flesh, had corrupted uh, their way on the earth. So again, it's just talking about how what the world was like, uh, filled with violence. Man, our, it just seems like our world just gets more and more violent every day. Uh, that there's just more and more and more. Um, and 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 I'm not even talking about. Uh, I'm not even talking about like war violence. I'm talking about like person on person. Just we we're just becoming more and more and more violent all the time. Uh, it, it seems like. So uh, the earth was filled with violence and it says that God looked uh, upon the earth. So listen, God's, God knows what's happening. God takes note of what's happening. God sees what's happening uh, and, and he knows. And then so in verse 13, so God said to Noah, he said, the end of all flesh has come before me because the earth is filled with violence through them. Behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Um, so he said, as, as a result of all this, I'm going, to, I'm going to destroy man. I'm going to destroy man and the earth. And so one of the things that, that I want to point out here, and I, I've, I've said this and made mention of it a couple times, but at the time of the flood, um, the entire earth was destroyed. All right, now, you, it, it wasn't just that the water came. I mean, and we've talked, and I've talked about how uh, we talked about how in creation it says that all the land was together and all the waters were in one place. And then it's after the flood that all of this gets gets separated. And that, you know, scientists will say that there was a great cataclysmic event upon the earth. There was. It was the flood. The entire world was uh, under this, this destruction uh, that, that came from this, this flood. Second uh, Peter... Uh, chapter 3, verse 6. Um, well, let me start in verse 5. Well, whatever. I'll start in verse 5. For this they willfully forget, uh, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water. Listen. By which the world that then existed perished being flooded by water. So Peter says that creation perished, that the world perished, uh, through this flood. And this was a huge cataclysmic event. The entire environment changed. And uh, I'm going to talk about that in a minute. You remember we talked about out creation. How he talks about this firmament. And how there was a mist uh, watering uh, the world. And there was a firmament above. A firmament belief. Which was a, a water. And it was like a water canopy. That was over the earth. Temperatures were pretty much constant anywhere and everywhere uh, there was a mist that watered everything there had been no rain up until this time because there didn't need to be because uh, you remember if you remember we talked about how it was like it was like a giant greenhouse sort of it had this greenhouse effect that was going on all of that changed after the flood all of it changed uh, geology changed is that the right word yeah geology changed uh, it everything changed the way the world was before the flood is not the way the world is now it is it is completely different that world that existed before uh was destroyed in in that flood uh it was a worldwide catastrophic event and uh just so also listen this wasn't just water fell from the sky it also talks about and and we'll see it uh, uh 
in next week that it was also water that came from below the earth that just burst up uh, through the ground. So it wasn't like it just rained a whole lot for 40 days and the world flooded. I mean, it, it was it was a cataclysmic event. I keep saying that, but but I want you to understand that it truly was and that there was water that burst forth from beneath uh, and that there was water that, that fell from the sky, but it was a, a great big event. Um, so starting in verse 14, 14 through 16, so he instructs Noah uh, to make a boat. It's really more like a barge. But let's, so verse 14, make yourself an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, cover it inside and outside with pitch. This is how you'll make it. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits and it's width 50 cubits and it's height 30 cubits. You'll make uh, a window for the ark and you shall finish it to a cubit from above and set a door on the side and you shall make it with lower, second, and third decks. Okay, so God comes and he tells Noah uh, to make this ark, to um, make this, I call it a boat, but you understand this wasn't a boat in that it really wasn't built to be navigated it was just built to float is all it was built to do. And uh, um, it was probably more like a box uh, instead of having whatever you, is that, what do you call that? Is that the keel? What do you call that? Yeah, it was, it was probably uh, more flat. Um, let me just get into a, a little bit. But anyhow, it was, it was divine for, it was designed for floating stability and not for navigation. They weren't supposed to guide it anywhere. It was just supposed to keep them alive. Um, I read somewhere that uh, they estimated that this thing could go to almost 90 degrees and just come on back down, you know. So anyhow, so um, it talks about cubits. So the thing about a cubit is we don't really know exactly. Um, the consensus is somewhere between 17 and and 24 inches, all right? Uh, and apparently it depended on what si part of the world you were in, different different uh, places used a different measurement for a cubit. So I'm going to just take 18 inches, which seems to be a very common, accepted, uh, what a cubit was is 18 inches, so that's a foot and a half. So what you end up with here is you get this thing that's 450 feet long, it's 75 feet wide, and it's 45 feet tall. Okay, so that's what you get. So, uh, um, so that's 450. Uh, what's a football field? It's 100 yards. So it's 300 feet. So it's about a football field and a half and uh, long and um, 75 feet wide, 45 feet tall. And uh, if you remember in there where I read... Um, it said, uh, da, 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 da. it's going to, at the end of verse 16, you're going to make it with lower, second, and third decks. So it had three levels. It had three decks on it. It also has, uh, uh, when it talks about this window around the top, you'll make a, verse 16, you'll make a window for the ark and you'll finish it to a cubit from above. Um, I, I see this as, again, a cubit from the top down about 18 inches and I see it all the way around this thing being an opening. I don't just, I don't see it as just like one little window. I mean, I see it as being a whole thing open. Obviously, you got to have ventilation, you got to have air uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so that's kind of, kind of the way uh, I see that. Uh, three decks and it says to make rooms. Um, let's see. Well, lower, second, and third decks. Um, I th anyhow, where did, where did I get that from? I'm going to get it from somewhere here in just a minute. Pardon? Verse 14. Oh, yeah. Make for yourself an ark out of gopher, work, gopher wood. And we don't really know what gopher wood is. Um, and make rooms in the ark. So it says to put rooms in it. Literally, the word is nests. I just thought it was neat that the word is literally nests because, you know, animals nest. They don't go to their room, 
you know, they, they, uh, they nest. So uh, I thought it was interesting that literally uh, the word was nest. So these animals were going to nest. And then, uh, so I'm going to do a few more things on this. He says to cover it with pitch. Um, verse 14, cover it inside and outside with pitch. So obviously he's going to put something on here that was going to seal it. Uh, fill in the cracks, seal it. It was going to keep the water out uh, and keep the water from, from getting inside. I think we can all understand that. The, the word that's used here for pitch is actually uh, a word that's used later on in the Bible for atonement. And we understand atonement as being what Christ did for us and that in, in he brought us that salvation. And so we don't have to face the judgment. So in essence, a New Testament atonement keeps the judgment off of us. This pitch, uh, you, which is from the word atonement, that's used on the ark, catch the, kept the judgment away from Noah and his family. It kept the judgment waters uh, away and kept them saved. And so uh, first use of that word that will be translated atonement uh, in the Bible. I thought it was interesting uh, and certainly uh, uh, is used in a way that, that we can understand it. Uh, so those are safe who are inside the ark that has the pitch and we are safe when we are inside of of the blood of Christ. And then he says, you know, you're just going to make one door on it, put a door on the side and um, reminded of, you know, Jesus saying, I am the door uh, to the sheep, uh, to the sheep pen. And he is the one door into the, the salvation, into uh, the safety, into the pitch dark that keeps out the judgment uh, water. So I thought that was all kind of interesting. Um, so verse 17 says, And behold, I myself am bringing flood waters on the earth to destroy from under heaven all flesh in which is breath of life, everything that is on the earth uh, it shall be. So um, the word that's translated here for flood, uh, and even in the Greek New Testament, the word that's used for the flood of Noah is a word, it's a very uncommon word. It is not the normal word for just a local flood. It's not the, it is, it is a very unique word thereby symbolizing and signifying that this is, this, what happened in the days of Noah was completely unique. It was worldwide. It wasn't just a local flood, that it was something totally different uh, than they would think of when they just thought of, you know, we had a flood and it flooded our house or whatever. This was completely catastrophic. Uh, and destru destructive, and I think the fact that it uses a completely different word is is uh, is unique. In fact, the meaning of the word, in fact, the word carries in it the meaning of destruction uh, and and destroying. And it's not just it's not just a flood. Um, so he says, uh, "I'm bringing floodwaters on the earth." Verse 17: From under heavens, all flesh. Uh, in which is the breast of life, everything that is on the earth will die. He is, everything is going to die. Uh, everything except, well, I would say except the water animals. Uh, but all of the birds, all of the beasts of the field, all of the people, um, everything is, is go going, going to die. Um, so I, I, I made this comment a while ago. I said, you know, it had never rained upon the earth until the time of Noah. And that is my belief. And that is a lot of people's belief. But I want you to know that, that really, um, we can't say that dogmatically. Uh, the Bible never really says that it had never rained on the earth before. But the reason that I believe uh, that it had not rained upon the earth before this time is, is again, uh, I have to go back to how we talked about uh, what the world and what the environment uh, was like during that time. In chapter 2, verses uh, uh, 5 and 6, it says, Before any plant of the field was in the earth, and before any herb of the field had grown, the Lord, for the Lord had not caused it to rain on the earth, there was no man to till the ground, but there was a mist that went up from the earth and watered uh, the whole face of the ground. So again, I, I see that pre-flood uh, environment as being something completely different than what we have now. Rain wasn't necessary, in, in, in other words. And then um, 
kind of to, to piggyback on that. Um, Hebrews eleven seven. I told you I was gonna. I told you to hang on to that that verse for a second because I was gonna use it in a minute. In Hebrews uh, chapter eleven verse seven, where it's talking about Noah, it says by Noah, by faith Noah, and then it says being divinely warned of things of things not yet seen. In other words, when God spoke to him and warned him about something that was coming, it was something that had not yet been seen, something that had not been seen before. So you, you could still make a lot of arguments for what those two passages mean, but I use those two passages and, and I believe that it means it had not rained upon the earth. I believe that there had been no rain until that time, but as far as I know, the Bible does not ever just say it had not rained upon the earth uh, before, before the flood, but I believe that it, that it had not. Um, <clears throat> anything before I go on? All right. Second Peter two, five, uh, was a ver another verse that I read a while ago. And it was the verse that said that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so, uh, you know, Noah was certainly, uh, warning the people, uh, it says he was a preacher of righteousness. He was certainly warning everyone while he was building this ark. He was warning them uh, to escape, to, you know, God was patient. God was still giving them a chance. God is always going to be patient. God is always going to give people a chance until it starts raining, right? Until it started raining. Once it started raining, they got in the boat, they shut the door, and it was too late. We talked about this when we studied Revelation. How God is just is just going to be patient, patient, patient through the whole thing. Give them opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And people will reject and reject and refuse to believe and refuse to believe. And finally, just God's just going to say, it's over. It's over. And um, then it'll, it'll be too late. One day it will be too late. Uh, just like it was for them. Verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you. You shall go into the ark, you and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives with you. Uh, again, in Genesis, especially early in these chapters, we get a lot of first words. First use of the word covenant. Uh, so we'll see that covenant in chapter 9. The covenant that God, well, you guys know what it is, right? What's the covenant that God made with Noah? That he would never destroy the earth by, by a flood again. Right, right. And what was the sign of it? The rainbow, right. So, so God said, I'm going to establish my covenant with you. Uh, I'm going to save you guys. Uh, go in there um, into the ark. Uh, verse, and of every living thing of all flesh, you shall bring two of every sort into the ark. Um, and you'll keep them alive with you. They'll be male and female of the birds after their kind, of the animals after their kind. And of every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind will come uh, to you to keep them alive. And you shall take for yourself uh, of all, and you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you uh, and for them. Thus Noah did according to all that commanded him. So did he. All right. So um, here he's telling him. Uh, uh, to bring uh, the animals. Uh, he says there's going to be two of each kind. So uh, w one of the things, and I'm not sure exactly about this kind, which the word sort may be equivalent to species. I don't know. So like, you know, like there may not have been two of every single particular uh, variation of every species in there, but there were certainly two of, 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 of every species. Um, that was, but that was in there. He says, you're going to take two, you're going to take a male and a female. Reasons for that are obvious so that they can, uh, reproduce once they, uh, get off the ark. Um, it's, you're going to take them with you because you're going to keep them alive. Um, birds, animals, all of them after their own kind, creeping thing of the earth, uh, two of everything of its kind, you will come to keep them alive. One little difference though uh, chapter 7, verse 2, he says, you're going to take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. So all the animals that the Hebrew people considered clean, you know, that wouldn't include pigs. Not, 
I think it's not cloven hooves, you know, but animals that were considered clean, uh, they were taking seven, not just two. We always think just two, but they were taking seven of the clean. I think some of that was probably so that when they got off, uh, they could have sacrifice. You know, they could worship uh, through offering uh, the sacrifice. So they took those, those uh, spiritually or religiously clean animals. God told them to take those so that they could sacrifice them. Um, so, you know, one of the big questions is, you know, would the ark be big enough? You know, um, so I read somewhere that uh, there's about 18,000 different species of animals. And uh, if you really think about it, and I never really thought about this until I read this, that, you know, most land animals really are relatively small. Now, obviously, the elephants aren't very small, right? Uh, but... Uh, in fact, they, they, and I don't know where they get this from. I don't know how they devise, devise this, but they say that probably the average size of all the, of all the land animals from the smallest to the biggest, on average, they're probably about the size of a sheep, uh, which, which means you have a lot of room, uh, you know, three, to, three levels, um, you know, football field and a half long. 75 feet wide and all that. So uh, I, I'm thinking there probably uh, was, in fact, if, if, if those calculations are right, um, they are probably plenty of room. And besides that, you know, most likely, um, I, I mean, this is just, this, this is not what it says in the Bible. This is just conjecture. Uh, you know, most likely the animals that were taken were were young. You know, maybe not super huge. Maybe uh, maybe a half-grown elephant. Maybe not a full-grown elephant. You know, uh, that uh, uh, most of the animals were probably young because they were going to be in there for a while, and then when they got out, they had to live long enough to uh, really reproduce and 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 start reproducing and and filling the earth again. So. Um, they were they were probably younger animals. Another thing about animals, and, and it's interesting, and, and even animals that we don't associate this with, it's almost like every land animal, they have this capacity to hibernate. They have this capacity to, uh, if they desire to, that they can just find them a spot and they can just sleep it off, you know. Now we know bears, we know they hibernate, but it seems like, you know, I think of like, you ever just pay attention to your cat? What do they sleep like 24 and a half hours or, or 23 and a half hours a day? I mean, you know, they curl up there. He's curled up on the recliner when I leave and he's curled up on the recliner when I come home. I mean, you know, get up and drink some water or something. I mean, I don't know. But, but you know, all animals really, and you can see animals like uh, in bad weather. You know, they have the ability to just... To just find a corner, find a hole, find some little spot, uh, and they can just curl up there and just stay there. You know, and they just have this ability to do that. So, um, probably wasn't a lot of you know animals roaming around on the ark. Uh, they probably just kind of uh, found their little nest and found their little spot, and they probably uh, just just stayed there. Um. In verse 20, it says, Of the birds and after their kind, and of animals after their kind, of every creeping thing of all the after, after its kind, two of everything, uh, two of every kind, and the next phrase is what jumped out at me. He says, uh, They will come to you. They will come to you to keep them alive. Uh, Noah didn't have to do anything. When it was time, they just started coming. They just started coming. God just, and again, now, obviously, this is a miracle of God because he would take a male and a female, just two of them, and they would come to Noah. But again, animals have an innate uh, instinct to migrate, to go somewhere. I mean, it's just inside of them, right? I mean, they just, they, I mean, they just, they just have this innate instinct uh, to be able to migrate and to be able to uh, go somewhere. So God used that. Obviously, it was still a miracle, but uh, God used that, and and He had them migrate straight to the ark, and uh, 
that's, that's where they went. Uh, again, uh, as I've already said tonight, I've, it seems like I say it every week, uh, because weather up to this point is probably uniform over the entire world because all of the land is together. You're not going to have this situation where, you know, well, these animals only existed way over here. You're, you're going to have all the animals existing everywhere, all over the earth. So it, it wouldn't have been an issue uh, that animals, a certain animal wouldn't have been close to, to the ark because they would have been. Uh, anything up to this point? Cause I, I'm about to close it, but you might have some questions up to this point. Right. Yeah, but to me, when he created and he said this is good, mm -hmm. well, you see God taking great care right. of what he created. Right. And I've never, I just never hit the right. like that. But right. Yeah, she just said, if you didn't hear her, she just said, you know, God could have created the animal. He could have destroyed them all and then created them again. He could have done the same thing with people, uh, but he didn't. He kept a few alive. And uh, because when he did create it, like you said, he said it was good. And so, so it was good. Um, anyone else? So just a quick question, not to go off on a rabbit hole or anything, but, um, so Donnie and I went to Glen Rose, mm -hmm. it's been a few years ago, mm -hmm. the Creation Museum, mm -hmm. and that dinosaur park, mm -hmm. and, um, so they had a little tiny park replica, mm -hmm. and in it were dinosaurs. Okay. So I'm just curious as to, uh, right. So I do believe, because if you read Job, you have two descriptions of two different animals that both sound like dinosaurs. One of them, the one he calls, I think the one he calls a Leviathan. Now it was a water creature, so it wouldn't have to be in the ark. But then he describes this other animal that when I was a kid in elementary school, we called it the Brontosaurus. This big, huge uh, vegetarian type of animal. So, and because it's described pretty much to a T there in Job, I believe it existed. And if it existed, I mean, it had to be on the ark. Uh, so, yeah, I don't have, I don't have a problem. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that depiction. Uh, although some people do believe that it was the flood that did away with all the dinosaurs. And that could be true as well. I don't know. Anything else? Uh, she said she said they went to Glen Rose to that ark thing and that there was a dinosaur in the ark and she was, she was asking me about that. Going back to the question, can God, can God change his mind? Uh-huh. That's true. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> That's right. We don't know what there you go. There you go. We'd never know it if he did change his mind. That's exactly right. All right. Anything else? So I'm going to close with verses 21 and 22. Uh, you'll take for yourself all the food that is eaten. Gather it for yourself and it shall be food for you and for them. Actually, it's verse 22 that I wanted to close with. It says, so thus Noah did according to all that commanded him, so he did he. Uh, so Noah uh, just did it. Can you imagine? I mean, I mean, this is huge. I mean, first of all, he's supposed to build this thing that's going to float. And it's going to take him 100 years. I mean, 70 something to 100 years. Uh, d <laughs> well, okay, well. You know, um, God told him to build it. Uh, I'm, you know, um, what you're asking is fair. And I mean, he might have, he might have had a little help. Obviously, I think his boys helped him, his sons helped him. But did he have to hire some more guys? Maybe, but if they would be interested in, uh, what are you building here, Noah? Well, it's this great big box that's going to keep us safe when there's water all over the earth. And they're like, not wasting my time or whatever. I don't know. But yeah, did he, did he build it or did he hire it out? So they had to get the that comes from a carpenter right there. <laughs> they had to get the animals to the other levels. I guess they used ropes or something. I'm trying to think. Oh, I'm sure there were ramps. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, that would go from yeah. from level to level. Uh, I think of Noah and his family stayed awfully busy all the time, taking care of all those animals right. and doing all that. Can you imagine? Right. I think some of them should have got thrown out that window, but I'm not, I'm not too sure. Anyhow, um, you know, God spoke to Noah, and God spoke to Noah often. And he gave Noah this big, huge, uh, insurmountable task. And Noah was, it just says that he just did it. God asked him to do it, and he just did it. And uh, that's part of how Noah uh, became a just man. Uh, perfect man and he walked with God is because God asked him to do something uh, and and he would just just do it and as a result um, you know Noah had fellowship with God um, that's really the idea behind walking with God he had fellowship with God so listen God's going to ask us to do things um, and Noah isn't the only one all through the Bible God asked people to do things that they would have said Oh, you're crazy. They would have said, that's ridiculous. I can't do that. That's impossible. That is truly a sign that God is working in your heart. God will ask you to do things that are scary. He will ask you to do things that you don't think you can do. He will ask you to do incredible things, but he will empower you to do it. And he just wants us to have faith and to just say, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm going to do what you're asking me to do. And, uh, and that's all Noah did. All right, anything before I close this?